Asheville's Office of Cultural Events and Special Academic Programs, I would like to welcome you all to the 2011 Cultural Events and Distinguished Speakers Series here at UNC Asheville. Before we get started, I did just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors that have really helped make this and other events like this happen, um, Biltmore Farms Hotels and WCQS FM Radio. So if you could help me thank them. And then I would also like to thank some folks here on campus um, that really were instrumental in helping put this together and as well as the whole uh, range of activities this week. The UNC Asheville Key Center for Service Learning, the Center for Diversity Education, and the Intercultural Center here at UNCA. And most importantly, our UNC Asheville students. We will be videotaping tonight's lecture, so um, at the end of Dr. Moore's talk, you'll notice that there are two microphones in the aisles, so if you will just come out and wait in line and you'll have a chance to ask questions of Dr. Moore. Right now, what I would like to do is introduce you to UNC Asheville's provost, Dr. Jane Fernandez. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the highlight of UNC Asheville's celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. week, and this week will continue until the 21st. We are honored and blessed to have a really distinguished speaker here with us tonight. Um, a few years ago, I was the provost at a university for deaf students, and I was working very hard on a diversity action plan. Uh, for our university. And one of our consultants, uh, Dr. Francis Kendall, said, oh, you all should go to the White Privilege Conference. So I thought, my lord, a White Privilege Conference? What is she talking about? Uh, but I went, right? and that conference was created by our speaker, Dr. Eddie Moore, Jr., who was then the director of the Intercultural Center at Central College in Palo Alto. And I went to that conference and I found um, almost 1,000 people all together sitting on the floor of a high school gym, sitting on the floor of the Motel 66 all night long talking about um, what it means to live in a country founded by white people for white people and the impact of the privilege that white Americans continue to enjoy, very often unwittingly, even today. And we talked about how that white privilege plays out at our schools and at our universities, and we got lots of great ideas about how to go back and create more socially just institutions. So you can imagine um, deafness is a very low incidence disability. And you, most people don't run into deaf people very often. So when we told Dr. Moore that a bunch of deaf people are going to the White Privilege Conference, well, it was a little bit um, of a challenge. Because all of a sudden, was how will we have enough interpreters for all of those four deaf people who want to go to the conference? It's impossible. How will we have enough money to pay for all of those interpreters? And uh, well, will all of the films that they show have captioned? So I would think it's safe to say we sort of got on his nerves a little bit. <laughs> um, but we went to the White Privilege Conference and we had a significant and meaningful experience. And I left thinking that Dr. Eddie Moore Jr. is a genius for having created such a great learning opportunity. 
And to my knowledge, the White Privilege Conference is the only conference, diversity conference, uh, that is run by African American people. And it's the only Afro-centered conference, so the structure of the conference is really African-centered. It's the only one I've ever attended. So that was a few years ago when time has passed. But last spring, I met him again at another conference, and he was giving a workshop um, called The N-Word and Beyond, Unpacking Social Oppression, Dismantling Hierarchical Language, Challenging the Popularity of Dysfunctional Pop Culture Communication. And I was so amazed in that workshop at how much um, Dr. Moore had worked on the concept of hearing privilege. Because I got to the workshop and every film that he showed had captions. Our interpreters didn't have to ask. They were already there. And not only that, um, they, he knew how to work with the interpreter and how to make sure he paced himself so that the interpreter got all the information. Um, also, even more amazing, there were deaf people represented in the films. And he showed how the N-word is used to apply to African-American people, but other words are used to apply to deaf people. And the same, um, same white privilege is at play there. So what I want to say about Eddie, uh, it's Dr. Moore, but I know him as Eddie. Um, he's a man who recognizes the impact of privilege and oppression. No matter who is privileged and who is oppressed, he's a leader who rolls up his sleeves and he does something about it. And as a white person, Dr. Moore inspires me and challenges me to understand the privilege that I have through my skin color and to work steadfastly to create more socially just institutions. So I can safely say he's one of my true inspirations. And so I'm really happy to have him here as our speaker. He earned a PhD in Educational Policy and Leadership Studies from the University of Iowa, which is a great school, by the way. I know of that school. Currently, he serves as the Director of Diversity at the Bush School in Seattle, Washington. He has an active record of community work. He is in demand nationally and internationally as a consultant on matters of diversity and equity. And he's a noted trainer, presenter, and keynoter. Tonight, he will be addressing us on the subject, 21st Century Leadership and Diversity. Are we ready? But I know that Asheville is ready, right? Yes, we're ready. Yeah, yeah, we're ready? Yeah. Okay. So he's going to help us know just how ready we are. Please give him a warm Asheville welcome. Mm. Well, I don't know if y'all have ever, well, let me say it this way. I had the great pleasure of listening to Sister Condoleezza Rice speak a couple years ago, and she reminded us in the audience that if you truly want to be growing in the work you do, have somebody in your life that checks you up every now and then. You got to have a perspective in your life that jars you or injures you in some way that you come back stronger. And so I have to say that Sister Fernandez is one of those injuries that hurt at the time. But boy, am I stronger because of it. So uh, I really appreciate her uh, being willing to support me in the work that I'm doing. And from the position that she sits as a white power broker to say that this conference is not a crazy place where they're burning white people at the stake. It's not the kind of place where they're doing harmful kinds of things, blah, blah, blah. It's important to have white folks stand behind the conference. And from the first time in which she's uh, encountered and, and, and experienced the conference, she's been someone that stood strong. And we've continued to stay in touch, and here I am now in her backyard. Some would say, you must be crazy bringing Eddie Moore Jr. for MLK. Um, but I am here, and I'm here strong. 
Um, I don't know y'all. Y'all don't know me. You may have read a little bit. But um, I come to you with mixed emotions this evening. You may have heard a little bit of Dr. King playing. I've been listening for about two weeks, and I listened throughout Black History Month just as a reminder of where I've come from. And as I look at this audience, I mean, uh, you can imagine, and I'm not without stereotypes from the South. I'm from the South. I grew up in Florida, so when I get the call from North Carolina, I'm thinking, I'm excited because I got a little work, but it's <laughs> North Carolina. <laughs> So um, I have to be honest with you and say, um, in light of some recent incidents, my wife said to me, um, this is one thing that I worry about is the work that you do and the way that you do it. And I, you know, I'm a faithful person. I live grounded in faith. So if that's the way I'm going, I'm going to be happy doing the work that I'm doing and going out that way. But when I stand in front of you and I look out in this audience and I think about where I am, I stand with mixed emotions. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm excited that I'm here at this outstanding university and this outstanding town with the kind of history and, and, and the kind of legacy that it seems like has been doing some great stuff and is doing some great stuff at the moment. But I also look out and I see folks as I hear Dr. King who were directly benefiting from the system in which he's speaking against. Like not in the way that these young men, Tyler and Jordan, are here just kind of hearing and listening and maybe wondering about what those times were like. But some folks sitting right in here drinking from water fountains different, taking jobs, promotions, simply because of status, name, appearance. And that kind of lights me up a little bit. So I come stirred up. And I'm going to try to stay focused. <laughs> but I need to know, I need y'all to know the state that I'm in. So this is going to be what I call a key shop. So I hope you didn't come here to think this brother going to drop knowledge for 30, 40 minutes, and you're going to be enlightened and walk out of here floating out of here doing great stuff for the rest of your life. Because, I mean, research shows as a speaker, I mean, people retain typically 10 to 15 minutes out of a 40 minute or so presentation. So what I've learned in doing speeches is you gotta do it in a way that's gonna capture folks in memory, for me. So I devised what I call a key shop where I don't just stand here for minutes spewing information in hopes you'll grab five minutes of it. I'm gonna put you to work. And I'm gonna hopefully challenge you and give you a little something to take out of here for action not for information. So I turn your attention to this map. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, middle school, I looked at this thing and thought, America, the beautiful. Land of the free. Home of the brain. That's what I saw when I looked at this map. But in the 21st century, Tyler and Jordan, bro, I tell you right now, if you look at this map, you need to know this map. Because in America, in the 21st century, America's changing. There's nothing we can do about it. You can send out all the anti-immigration mail you want, build all the walls you want, all this kind of stuff that people are trying to do to stop folks from coming, so to speak, stop the changes from happening, so to speak. But the bottom line is this, America's changing. There's nothing you can do about it. The question is, are you going to be ready? Are you prepared? Are you prepared? Are you preparing yourself? Are you preparing your young people for a multicultural, global society? Because in the 21st century, this map matters. You just think about the places on this map that are interacting and involving itself just on the news in our country alone. And for those of us who may have grown up in the 80s, 70s or so, I mean, for me at least, I look at this, I just don't see much that I recognize from growing up. Maybe Africa a little bit where I thought and knew or heard or learned people came from and all that kind of stuff. Maybe the UK with the king, queen, sister. I mean, some stuff I could 
point out a little bit. But in the 21st century, my brothers, this you got to know. This map is a starting reminder for all of us that preparation is key in the 21st century. As you listen to Dr. King, as I think about Dr. King, I mean, I believe, for me, I'm hearing a 20th century address. And there are some applications, no doubt, for the 21st century, but I think things have changed. I mean, the way racism, the way oppression showed up in the 20th century is different in the 21st century. Folks can't hit the streets or hit the organizations or hit the system. You can't stand from your porch and say what you could have said in 1910 or 1911 and 2011. So how can we apply the same kind of philosophies or strategies in 2011 or the 21st century if things have shifted from the 20th century? So I ask you, as you look at this map, to take this journey with me and begin to question yourself. Are you ready? Where did you get the skills to be global in your communication? Where did you get the skills to serve, to communicate, to associate, to interact with somebody from the 21st century? Now, have you, I don't know if y'all have encountered folks in your life in the year 2011 that sometimes think like it's 1911? Yeah. You ever meet folks and you think, how did you get into the general population? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I tell folks this way, demographically, when you think about change, I say to folks, I'm just like the we game system. I'm just like connect from the PlayStation or Xbox game system. I'm just like 3D TV. In fact, I go on to say to folks, I'm just like Kid Cudi. I mean, you, you, you try to get away from Cudi, but he's just there everywhere. Eventually, I'm going to show up in your home. You can no longer run from me. You think about this in the 20th century, how many folks live their lives, their entire lives, in a segregated model, especially in the university system. But in the 21st century, we are going to all meet someday soon. The question is, are you going to be ready? Are you going to be prepared? Now, my advice to young people is to get out in front. Like, don't wait for something traumatic and trauma, uh, disastrous to happen. Most folks react when disaster strikes. Be in a preparatory mode, my brother. Right? Get yourselves prepared so that you are ready when it comes. Don't wait till something disastrous happens and you think, oh, my gosh, we got to do something now. Preparatory mode. Are you ready? Now, I don't know about y'all, but for me, when I grew up, I grew up with segregation skills. I didn't grow up with integration skills. I didn't grow up as Dr. Diversity. I grew up as Dr. Destruction, if you look at it in that, the way, in that way. Now, I grew up in a, a, a little town uh, down south called Punta Gorda, Florida. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Florida or PG. I think we got a couple, or at least one represented from PG Strong, right? So I grew up in PG, and I mean, I tell people, it's not like we didn't see white people in Punta Gorda. But I mean, really, I could live a segregated life if I didn't want to hang out with white folks. And it was really kind of two towns, Punta Gorda, Port Charlotte. And so I grew up in the Punta Gorda side on the project side. Right? And so I tell people, I grew up, I love black people. I hung out with black people. I worship with black people, play ball with black people. I mean, I lived a segregated life. And then I ended up in college in Iowa. <laughs> now, I don't know if any of y'all ever been to Iowa, but <laughs> when I got to Iowa, I jokingly tell folks, I never thought there were so many white folks in America until I got to Iowa. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, they are everywhere, right? Because again, we saw them at home, but man, everywhere. I mean, sometimes in Iowa, you see a black person, it's like, oh my God, hug me. I mean, it's like, woo, I ain't seen a brother in months, it seems like. 
But I jokingly talk about that, but I really like to point to this issue of preparation, though. I was not prepared for that kind of environment, because not only had I not been familiar with dealing with white folks that long, every day, all day, I hated white folks. I learned in my training that white folks many times were the cause of all the evil in my environment. So not only was I prepared to be positive and productive in that environment, I took a little edge with me. Right, so when I speak about this work and this global phenomenon and this global perspective, right, I speak about it from a preparation perspective, mainly because I talk about my just incapability when I went off to Iowa. Just segregated and narrow in my perspective. And I feel like I've made a tremendous amount of progress, absolutely but I ask you to think about where you are right now. I mean, where did you get the skills to be global in perspective? And I was in a classroom today on campus and I was looking around the classroom and I had to tell the young people there, I mean, you guys need to get up with the times. If you haven't gotten the memo yet, but this is not what America looks like. <laughs> this is not it. And if you are training yourselves to be in a segregated model, you're doing yourself a disservice. And I can tell you right now, living in a place where some of the richest people in the world live, Seattle, Washington, that if you make applications to some of the big companies in Seattle, like a Starbucks or like a Microsoft, and you don't have diversity skills, you need not apply. And these are some of the places that reward you the greatest in salary and benefits, but you can't apply if you have segregation skills. So for me, I think it's important if it's not just for the job perspective, because sometimes people are motivated. If you tell them you're going to get paid, they may then begin to prepare. Sometimes the money is the inspiration. But I ask you, as we go through this quick journey here together, are you ready? Where did you get the skills to be global in your perspective? I know for me growing up, I didn't get those skills. I got segregation skills. And I don't really believe that I'm gonna get to where I wanna be, but you know, perfection for me is not something I'll obtain, but I'm gonna be excellent as I pursue it. And so I ask you as we go through, are you ready? I mean, can you, can, can, can you get through this map? Can you show up? Jordan, I want you to be so good, my brother that in 20 years I can drop you anywhere on this map and you're gonna make money. I can drop you anywhere on this map and you can save a life. I can drop you anywhere on this map and you can make people feel like they're somebody. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about diversity from a leadership perspective. Right, because when I go to colleges where there are resources and folks are paying money, I mean, my assumption is that you're not just acquiring this education to just be regular old folks going to work, punching in and out every day. I'm talking to you from a leadership perspective. Like, what you gonna do when you're done? Right, how you gonna make things happen when you get done? That when you make a call in 20 years, 25 years, people are gonna return your call. That's the kind of person I'm expecting you to be, leaving this fine institution. So I ask you from a preparatory position, from a preparatory state, from a preparation model, to attach it to leadership, not just regular old day-to-day, -day, everyday folks. Not that I'm opposed to that, but in the 21st century, we definitely need folks who are in this perspective in power positions. Are you ready? Where did you get the skills from? This sheet is my Iowa sheet. I like to go back to Iowa. That's why it's white in the background. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. This is kind of my Iowa sheet. You know, uh, I, it's, 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 it's actually kind of a little test that I do for folks. And um, I tell people you have 30 seconds to go through this sheet 
and circle as many numbers as you can, but you have to circle them in order. Now, we don't have time, and I don't have enough sheets. Uh, if I had, you know, uh, all day session, I'd give each of you a sheet, and we'd do this exercise. But I, I want to refer to this because it's important for this preparation piece because when I went to Iowa, I mean, I had work to do and was doing work, but what I uh, decided to do when I went back to get my master's degree in Iowa, um, I decided to volunteer at schools, and I wanted to work with young black males. And so I would go to these schools and, and I'd be reading to the brothers, you know, just wanting them to see a professional black male every week was my model, all right? Because I believe if you do it over and over and over again, you get better at it. It rubs off on you. I, unlike Charles Barkley, will take pride in being a role model. <laughs> I used to tell the kids in Iowa, I am, remember me, because I am just like every black person in the world. Because sometimes in some places in Iowa, those kids, I was the only black guy they would ever interact with. So I would go in some schools, right, and those kids would see me walking down the halls and be like, oh my God, oh my God, look, look, look. It's Michael Jordan, right? <laughs> so <laughs> those kids just had, you know, they were honest, brutally honest, just had, unfortunately, they just had media as their guide. So what I was learning working with these young brothers is a lot of these kids, Right? They had never really had a real life interaction. And what this sheet reminds me of with those kids is, you know, typically when you begin to experience diversity of whatever kind for the first time, it can be a little nerve wracking. It can create a little uneasy state of mind. And usually when people get scared, they get more reserved. Sometimes they can even get meaner more isolated, more restricted, I have found. So uh, this sheet, sometimes when you go through it and you have very limited instructions, people will do anything they can to try to get the 80, especially when I put a prize on the line, right? So picture that in an activity and people are trying to get through there. And really it's just chaos because they're frustrated, they're mad, they're like, ah, I can't even find number three, right? And so typically, I have found that some of what happens to folks when they experience some diverse is issues or situations for the first time, it can be a little frustrating. So the work I do and the work I tell people to continue to do is to get in your life some resources, some sources, some things that can help you get through this sheet a lot easier, a lot smoother. It's not that you'll get to 80. The beauty of the work around diversity, right, the work around leadership and diversity is it requires you to keep reading. You have to keep studying because the dynamics of our nation, of our world, are continuing to become more complex and change faster and faster. So you got to keep up on it. It's like being a hip hop star. You can't produce the same beats every year and expect your sales to rise. You got to switch it up a little bit. All right, so for me, the sheet is a reminder or source. So as you look at the state you're in from a preparation perspective, then you gotta ask yourself, next step, what am I doing to upgrade, to move forward? I sometimes think people in the year 2011 are operating like Apple II ECs, right? I mean, you can't be using information from that far back. You gotta upgrade your equipment a little bit. I don't know about y'all, but this is Iowa, Iowa. It's an Iowa story, right? I, I love movies, so I rent movies all the time when I was in this small town, Pella, Iowa. Right, small town, you know, you go to the same place. I mean, you get your coffee, same place. By the time you get to the counter, after a little time, your coffee's ready, bam. Love that, miss that about small town. So renting movies, I mean, I got to know the movie lady, blah, blah, blah. So we're getting to know each other, interacting with each other, you know, so eventually we start talking about family, kids, all that stuff. So uh, she's got a five-year-old. She says to me one day, man, my five-year-old is so excited. Today in her class, she has a new kid. It's a little colored boy. Now, <clears throat> now, I just hurt saying it, you know what I'm saying, right? Now, again, I don't think she intends to send the kind of injury that I receive. In fact, when I question her on it, she says what? I had no idea, no clue. Right, this is 2007, six. 
And this lady still referring to black folks as colored people. And what it reminded me of is some folks, their sources are a little outdated. Some folks don't even know what to say is. They don't want to say black, African-American. I'm saying, try Eddie. It works. <laughs> like, use my name. But if you don't know, ask somebody. But seriously, you got to have your trusted source. This sheet is about sources. As you assess just how sick you are. Because we're all sick. I mean, you can't be in this place we call America with the kind of history that it's had and not inhale some of the fumes. So we're all sick. Some of us are like, you know, stitches, same day, in and out, half hour, hour. Now, depending on the kind of environment you come from, I was like E.T., like I needed a tent all by myself. <laughs> I needed that, I mean, isolated confinement. That's how sick I was around some of these issues. But we all got work to do. I used to think, man, if you white folks just get it together, come together, right? Things would be so much better if white folks would just get it right. But what I've come to understand when I take a deeper critical look at myself is we all got work to do. It's not just white folks who have to do diversity work. We all have work to do. So what I ask you to do as you think about the state you're in, how sick you are, is you also think about the source and what you're gonna get your information, get your knowledge. That's Iowa right there. <laughs> Today, I had the great honor of going to Randolph and see myself in the classroom. <clears throat> to see talent underestimated. To see talent predicted for destruction. I gave them my story about how crack nearly broke my back. And uh, it was just powerful to just see myself in the classroom. <clears throat> I look at this picture, you know, and I think about those kids in Iowa and where they are today. But for many of those kids, I mean, I'm the first black guy they ever had an extended hand, an interaction with. And I wonder, I thought this would change in Seattle. Progression, you know, progressive Northwest. What I find is it's not like folks haven't seen me in Seattle, but often the way they've seen me hasn't been from the doctor perspective, <laughs> but from the service perspective. So sometimes the messages uh, aren't always healthy, even though you have day-to-day -day interaction. So when you think about source, I mean, the kids in Iowa at least knew where they were and complete and experience. They were sick in a different way. But what I find in some places is that, I mean, Dr. Black Man, Eddie, just can't go together in their psychology. That's a whole nother kind of injury. So I ask you to think about just how sick you are, because America's changing. And the question is, are you ready? So this is just proof of that. I mean, 2008, yeah, if you get away from the pie chart, that's just another way of showing what's down in the writing. 68% of uh, uh, white folks are Americans. In 2050, they're saying 46%. You see the shift. Now, these are only predictions. I always say to folks, I mean, don't scare folks too quickly around these numbers. These are only predictions. Latino folks, Hispanic folks, you know, from 15 to 30. Non-Hispanic black folks from 12 to 15, not much of a shift. Asian Americans from five to nine. These are just ways in which I try to say to folks, these are the changes coming. Now, what's missing here is the Tiger Woods box. Now, I could say that before Tiger got himself all jacked up a little bit, but you know, the multiracial box. I mean, because really it was Tiger who said, I'm not black. I'm kind of, kind of well, I mean, something. He was, he was multiracial, basically. But it's really important for us to pay attention to that because in the census now, I mean, and back in 2000, you could choose multiple boxes. Before that, you couldn't do that. It was very limited in your selection. 
But now we're beginning to see folks choose more than one box. That's not indicated in these numbers. Now, as you probably know, some of you directly, is when kids come from multiracial identities, that's a different kind of story. That's a different kind of challenge. That's a different kind of preparation, possibly. I don't know if any of you black folks have ever, ever been accused of being white folks. Sometimes you can be black and folks got you all mixed up because you in college trying to get an education. You talking? That's perplexing. That's a different kind of injury to talk about. That's a whole nother workshop. That's my N-word workshop I get to the next time I come back. But my point here is I wanted to give you evidence that I didn't just make up these numbers things, this Xbox theory. This Kid Cudi theory. All right, there are numbers that are going to show the changes are coming. Change, change, change. It's coming. The question is, are you going to be ready? Now, I don't know about you, but I see people, they just have one diversity moment, or what I call a punch card moment. They'll have one friend, cousin, cousin's uncle's cousin who adopted a Latino kid. They'll listen to Aretha or Drizzle. Right? They'll go to one conference or one speaker for MLK for the year. And they punch that card and say, I got this diversity stuff done. Some folks take this punch card approach and trying to get themselves prepared. And that's not the way to go for me. So I ask you to think about these statistics, these changes, because they're coming. And the question is, are you ready? This is my story in detail. I just don't have the time to give it to you. I can tell you this. I have a job. I went to college. And I'm a pretty nice guy. So I'll give you the rest if you need it in detail. But I got to keep going because I got some more I want to give you. Again, not for the sake of knowledge, for the sake of action. I'm hoping you're consuming this. You're walking with me here, not so you can read, leave here with notes and say, I went to the speaker. But I want to leave you, uh, ask you to leave here with something you can do from Jordan to the most seasoned veteran in the room. Everybody take some action. So that's what I'm challenging you to do. Now, when you think about diversity in a skill perspective, when I ask you about preparation, are you ready? You must think comprehensively. Now, I used to think, man, if I could just start to like white people, then maybe I'm making some real progress. And I would say, man, I'm cool with John, man, but I can't stand those fags, man. So I would say one thing as if I was making changes in one area, and then I would be totally disrespectful, disrespecting, destructive in a whole nother area. And what I've learned in doing this work and what I challenge you with is when you do work, when you prepare yourself from a diverse perspective, you do it comprehensively. You can't just take one group, one friend, one experience and think that applies. So when you check yourself up, check it up comprehensively. So your skill development is comprehensive. Now, it's important to remember that this is not work in which we're going to all hold hands and skip out of here singing Kumbaya. Now, I don't know about y'all, but for me, there's some of these issues where if you do it on like a scale of skills and where you are, some of these issues, I'm at about a five or a six maybe seven. I think there's still room to always keep going. I try to get the eight, nine fluctuating there. Now, age as an example, right? I, I, I grew up with a pretty good sense of that because my mom always told me, boy, you should respect your elders. So I had a pretty good gauge there. I didn't start as sick in that area as I did in some other areas. And when I got out of college, I took a job at Walmart part-time trying to make a little extra hustle, so to speak. And um, I don't know if you've ever been to Walmart in Florida, but you can find a range of folks working there, let's just say. And so some of the folks I worked there were from the community that offers some age diversity. And because of those experiences, my skill set grew. So anything you do over and over and over again, you can get better at it. Like if you swear and you decide to swear all summer long, by next year when you get back to school, you will be much better at it. 
anything you do over and over and over again, you get better at it, seriously. I mean, we know that from music, from theater, from athletics. I mean, that's why you practice. And you can, diversity works that way as well. Or anti-diversity, as I like to call it in some areas. So as I look at this sheet, I look at it in a scale perspective. You can look at it. I mean, you can find areas where you have strengths and areas where you have weaknesses. If you just go down that sheet, there are some areas where I have some strengths. There are some areas where I've made some improvements. There are some areas where I'm still sick, sick, sick. I mean, I started in such a negative area, I'm trying to get to zero to start some progress. Sexual orientation, that would be one of those areas for me that I was in the negative numbers. I ain't even started at zero. I'm still trying to get past one or two. And you know, I'm a smart practitioner because when people are really smart, they will lie. They'll cut, they'll cut corners. This is what I found in diversity, and I'm not innocent of this. So what I tried to do when I was working on the toughest thing, like sexual orientation, right? I'd go to the gay bar. That's what you do, right? I'd go to the gay parade. That's what, I got a gay friend, right? I use all this superficial kind of stuff, saying I'm making all this work happen, I'm doing all this work, where actually I was just lying through my teeth, faking, flossing, smart, right? Not really having anybody in my circle checking me up, so thinking I'm making all this progress when actually I'm just faking and flossing. So, that's why I try to test myself just to find out if I'm doing anything or making any progress. Now, one of my tests for myself around that issue was, again, movies, because I love movies, right? So one of the movies that came out a few years ago, you probably remember this movie, Brokeback Mountain. Right? I'm a big Heath Ledger fan, right? And uh, so when the movie came out, I was like, man, this is it, right? Dr. Diversity gets to have a test. This is it. I'm going to take a look at this, right? And I love, love movies. You know, Titanic with Leonardo, I was on the bow with my hair just flowing back, right? <laughs> right, Jerry Maguire, you had me at hello, boom, I was there. Right, Diary of a Mad Black Woman, boy, I was there. Right, so Brokeback Mountain was billed as a love story. And I'm thinking, okay, this could be my test, right? And if any of you have seen this movie, you remember this movie, it opened up with a love scene. Now, typically, if it opens up with a heterosexual love scene, I'm like, yeah, dog, go, 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 get it, get it, get it, get it. Like, I'm cheering the guy on. But this love scene was a very different love scene. And what came up for me was disgust, was sickness, right? And it helped me remind me, helped remind me that even Dr. Diversity talking all that smack about the good work I'm doing was sick, sick, sick. So I see people floss all the time. People will smile at you eight hours, 10 hours straight as if they're happy to have you around, lying through their teeth. So for me, I take this diversity work, I mean, this is serious work for me, particularly when you're looking at young people and what's coming in the 21st century and you're looking at people dying because of these issues. People taking their lives or losing their lives or having their lives taken away from them because of these issues. This is serious stuff. And I think as leaders, especially, we got to be engaged and familiar and conscious, but most importantly, doing our own work as well. So I can tell you as a person who's been committed to this work and doing it from an a educator's perspective, from a consultant perspective, and even trying to do it on myself, that I am still struggling, working hard. And so I challenge you, as you take a serious look at where you are, that you do it comprehensively. And understand that this is tough work. This is hard work. So this says, tough and complex. It's not kumbaya, lighting lighters, not just lighting fires and thinking, holding hands and singing songs. This is hard stuff. I tell people, you shouldn't do a celebration multicultural dinner until you earn it. Do something tough, and then let's cook some food. <laughs> that you not just talk about cultural competence, but you talk about confidence, right? Like anywhere you show up on the map, you have a confidence to deal with the folks that you will face. Uh, and that you're doing action in that work. 
and not just learning the right words to say. Some people think if you just learn how people worship, if you just learn how they talk, if you just say hello in their language, if you just bow, if you just serve chitlins, if you just blah, blah, blah. It's amazing how people get these superficial, again, small punch card kinds of measures thinking they're doing work. It's not just about the word you say. But most importantly, thinking about patterns of behavior, like what you're doing differently from the times before you. And this is 1910, I touched on this, 1911, 19, 2011, that you not just look at individual work, but you gotta look at systems, which you're gonna get to in a little bit more. Skills, skills, skill. Let me ask you this, could you be a racist and not know it? Let me ask you in this way, if you were a racist and you didn't know it, would you want me to tell you? <laughs> now most people say, well, can you send it in a text message? Right? It depends on how you say it. <laughs> right? So here's what you got to think about as you do your work, right? Sometimes you can be doing your work, but you could be doing things that's offensive, that's oppressive, that's destructive, and you don't even know it. So as you check yourself up, right, you got to think about the things you could be doing that are destructive that you don't even know. But today is your lucky day. Dr. Diversity is here to give you a proper assessment. All right, so if I had time, what I would really ask you to do is take some time to fill this sheet out because what I begin to find is people pick up their ugly patterns of behavior from the environments in which they come from. So in order for me to help you with your illness, I got to know how sick you are. And this sheet, just like any doctor sheet, gives me some detailed information about where you come from. Now, I don't know if you can get a quick glance at this sheet, but what I find in Iowa, this is Iowa, probably not in North Carolina, because you guys live probably a much more multicultural, integrated life than they do in Iowa. Mm. So in Iowa, what people say in Iowa or find in Iowa is there's a lot of ones and twos on the sheet. And people will lie on this sheet because they don't want to think, they don't want to be too bad and have all ones. So they'll say, well, our fire department had a Dalmatian, so does that count, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, but people will kind of fudge it a little bit because they don't want to seem so bad all the time. Now, again, if you come from ones and twos, that doesn't make you the cause of all the evil in the world. It's important to think about that and understand that. Right? But when you come from ones and twos, you got to think about skills, like things, perspectives, knowledge, information that you get pertaining to these issues. Now, for me, for example, in my ones and twos, in some of these areas, right, my mama still taught me, boy, you respect folks. You be all that kind of stuff. Their parents work hard, all that kind of stuff. It's not like I didn't learn good things in those environments. But I also had some things going on around me related to those other issues that were pretty unhealthy. And I may not have realized that at a young age, and I may not now as an adult, those things are still happening, but I may feel about them differently than I do now, particularly around GLBTQ issues, some of that I learned in my worship place. Now that's a whole nother workshop, but the point is, Okay, the point is, some of that behavior, some of that psychology, some of those patterns of thought, that's where I picked them up. Now, I know having somebody in my family who's still struggling with those issues or battling and having conversations with me about those issues, that I may not get folks in my family to where I am, to have the kind of perspective that I have around those issues. And you know, there are some pancakes you'll never flip over. I mean, that's just not going to be the success Every time you're not going to ex experience success in that manner, so you can't go into it saying, I'm going to change Dr. Moore, I'm going to change him, I'm going to make him, make him, make him, all that kind of stuff. Because there are some folks who just may be set. So you try to find common areas in which you can be in agreement. So in my family around those issues, I at least have agreement from my sister that what happened to that kid in New Jersey? No kid should experience that at college around those issues. So we can have a common link on that. So she may not change her perspective wholeheartedly, but we can be in agreement on that. So back to this sheet. How sick are you? 
this is a way to begin to zero in on the things that you learn. I always ask people, is your life different today than it was back in the day? How different? One of my favorite preparation stories in talking about what you learn from a young age, this is an Iowa story. I'll just give you a couple of these. One of them is from my friend, uh, Diane, who's not on this, this sheet, but it's an Iowa story. It, well, actually, it is up here. I just saw it there. You know this story. I won't give it to you in full detail. I'll give it to you in fill in the blank. So fill in the blank. This is Iowa. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch a tiger. Whew. Start sweat a little bit when I, <laughs> right. But my friend told me in their neighborhood, they learned that nursery rhyme in a very different way. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a by the toe. Now think about that at three years old, five years old, six years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. If you learn nursery rhymes with those kind of words in it, what that does to the psychology, the patterns of behavior, how that influences so when I talk to you about preparation and going deep, right, that's the kind of story I'm talking about. Like, you can't Kid Cuddy that away. You can't Aretha that away. You can't one friend that away. That takes some work. If you're bombarded day to day, every day in that kind of environment. So when you're dealing and coming from that kind of situation, that takes some real work. It's really sad to know that people are still in Iowa teaching kids nursery rhymes with those kinds of words in them. Brazil nuts. Wow. That's amazing to me. But when I talk to you about preparation, that's what I'm talking about. So when you think about making the change, making the transformation, it's important to understand it's not going to be easy. It's hard work. I, 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 I often talk about this, uh, what I call the formula, like two plus two is what? Right, you see this activity, I haven't got so, um, I haven't got so sophisticated in which I can flash these out one at a time. I'm working, trying to get there. Maybe I'll have Jordan hook it up for me at the end of this session, because usually the young kids can get it right for me. So two plus two is four. All right, so this is, again, talk about the difficulty of the change, right? Once you realize how sick you are, you got to realize that it's not going to be easy making the transformation, okay? This formula helps reinforce that, because when we grow up, what we learn is two plus two is four. 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 And then I ask you, what's two plus four? Two plus two, and you say in unison? Oh. Right, all right, good. So that's what happened to me when I went to Iowa, right? My mama told me my first year I did this, but I didn't do so well in the years afterwards, but I did follow it my first year. She said, boy, make sure you go to church. So I did that in my first year. The years after that, that's a whole nother workshop. But the point is, when I went to church in Iowa, I would go to these churches in Iowa, and they would have church in one hour. And I'd be sitting there thinking, man, how can these white people have church in one hour? Right? That's not church. Right? And the preacher couldn't sing. Like, I mean, how do you become a preacher and you can't sing? You're not a, he's not a preacher. Right? Because in my mind, that's what four look like. So you can see how we get caught on patterns of behavior. It becomes our truth, the way our light, the way we see things, the way things should be. And what I was doing is degrading, demeaning my friend's way of worship because in my mind, that's what four look like. You with me? Okay, so what I had to learn is other people see four very differently. And so these are examples in which you can see four. That's a valuable skill to have in the 21st century, to be able to appreciate families. If you're going to become a teacher and you have a model in your mind of what families are going to look like, you need to shift that a little bit. Because in the 21st century, that's going to be very different. Like if you're in higher ed and you have a picture of what your provost should look like, you might want to shift that a little bit because that can change in the 21st century. All right? If you're in leadership in some way and you got a picture of your president, you might want to shift that a little bit because that can change. I never thought it would, but it's just nice to see, I mean, outside of the political realm, just to see the shift for the purpose of the direction we want to go in. 
Now, we could be in disagreement about where the president is politically, but from a visual standpoint, right, to have that shift, right, to believe that some people thought Ford should only look this way. You with me? So are you ready? Like, where did you get the skills? Where did you learn the skill to see Ford differently? Have you ever, I just came from New York. And I don't know if you've ever been a play. I, did, I do this activity with the kids, and they usually put up three plus one. Then they'll say two times two. And then they'll say maybe the square root of 16. I was doing it for some kids, middle school kids, and one kid said quattro. And I was like, man, I don't, how do you spell that, right? I was trying to remember how to spell quattro, right? It just caught me off guard. Have you ever had diversity catch you off guard? <laughs> In the 21st century, you need to be prepared. So when I was in New York, New York could do that to you. But you'll be like, wow. <laughs> 21st century, for me, I believe that's the exciting thing about what's happening in our nation, in our world, is we're finding folks in leadership positions, in power positions. I met a sister today, the head of disaster prepared, like, you know, the emergency, right? And all my years in education, i would never even seen a woman in that position. To see a sister in that position, right? And I'm thinking about all those meetings that I've gone to where we had to prepare for, you know, emergency, and all I've seen is white dudes in that position. Nothing against white brothers. I mean, I, some of my best friends are white. That's what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? But seriously, think about that. For people's psychology to see something completely different, that's what the 21st century is bringing us. That's exciting for me. But we got to be ready for that because those folks don't need support. Somebody got to watch their back. Somebody's got to say, hey, you may be in disagreement, but it shouldn't be about that. So... As I close in on my closing statements, let me remind you, America's changing. The question is, are you ready? Give yourself a little assessment. Determine just how sick you are. And once you determine how sick you are, then make sure you find a source that's going to feed you, that's going to nourish you back to health in a good way. And remember, if you got some eeny, meeny, miny, mo in your life, mm, that's not going to be easy stuff. That's where this poem follows up as a reminder. 2010, it says there, but really it should say 211. Are you ready? Right? How have you prepared yourself differently? Individual, we have work to do, all of us. And then the work that I do now is really about systems. I don't know if y'all remember when um, Bill Cosby and his wife lost their son in a tragic accident on the highway. Uh, it was, I think, you know, he was changing his tire or something like that and murdered. And at that time, there was this piece, you can Google this if you want. And um, uh, Camille wrote this article about how she felt America was responsible partially for the death of her son because the guy who killed her son wasn't from America. He had really kind of got here as a new immigrant but had learned some pretty negative things from his interactions with folk as it refers to African Americans, particularly African American males. And after that uh, killing, he was actually bragging in the prison, in the, in the jail about what he had done, thinking that that was a good thing. Right? And it reminded me about, again, systems, right? Like individually, you can do great work. You can be a great person. But if you join a lousy institution, you could end up doing some pretty unhealthy things. So your work on yourself is just not enough. You got to have system organizational analysis. Right? Because systems change people all the time. And so uh, another part of the work that I do looks at systems. So as you do individuals' work, you got to also make sure you're part of systems. I mean, this includes sports teams. This includes, I mean, theatrical groups, music groups. I mean, all those things are a part of organizations, people getting together. And if I get you a part of my team, which I try to do with my middle school kids, is I try to change their minds, make them a little tougher. Get them to dive on the floor, to high five, to show some energy, right? To use that moment in that structure of an organization, of a team, to change their individual behavior. Sometimes that can be done in a good way. 
But sometimes that could be done in an eeny, meeny, miny, more way as well. So you got to understand system dynamics, organizational dynamics. That's the next piece that's important as you do individual work, is understanding systems. And I think that's the piece as you listen to Dr. King and the direction he was going, that's what he was talking about as America, as a whole, as a system. That's what he was talking about when he's talking about power, when he's talking about wealth, when he's talking about distribution, he was talking about systems. Because you could be doing good work individually and be a part of something horrific. So you got to have system analysis. Oh. Have you guys seen this book about Joy DeGruy? I heard she's been to town, post-traumatic slave syndrome. Yeah. I think her book really does a good job in talking about slavery as a system, right? How something so devastating lasts for hundreds of years can still have behaviors from that system in today's population. You with me? <coughs> Right, that's what the book, that's the premise of the book. So I like that, right? But what I often ask is, what about post-traumatic slave master syndrome? Amen. Like, what could be the behaviors, not only from those who descended from slaves in today's society, but what about the slave master's kids? Like, what other behaviors they could be doing? Like, understanding that system's permeation into today's society. That's important. Some of the folks who've written about this uh, are trying to touch on some of this. Joe Fagan and his book, Two-Faced Racism, as well as um, his book about the white racial frame, right? Trying to help us understand from a systemic analysis how the design of this system we live in called America can be having an impact on how we act and interact day to day. And it's, I mean, it's, let's just say, people tend to like me up to this moment of the presentation because this can push folks a little bit. But I think it's critical that we go to system analysis, particularly when we're talking with young folks in the audience. Now, I don't know where you are with this, but I, I attempted to try to grab some financial numbers, but you can, you know, basically what this is saying is what people say all the time, and I don't know if you hear this or have heard this, but people say the rich are getting Right, and the poor are getting poor. So this is, 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 is in some way trying to identify or help people to see in a pie chart what that wealth distribution is looking like or net worth is looking like. And you can Google this kind of information. I advise you to do that. Don't say that without knowing what it looks like. It's important for us to understand that. Okay? So I designed a theory that I want to share with you in closing so I can have some time for questions. Okay, so in order to embrace this theory, I need you to go under my spell for five minutes. <laughs> now the beauty of this spell is you can be released in five minutes and go back into the normalcy or whiteness of the world that exists today, I argue. Now, you can be in total disagreement with me, and that's fine. And this is not something that uh, the university supports. This is Dr. Moore, just for the sake of my sister and, you know, getting me here. So this is me, five minutes, all right? I got five on. OK, so here we go. America was designed by white people for white people. Now, you can disagree with me. Did Columbus discover America? Was Thomas Jefferson worthy of a holiday? I mean, there are people and places and events in our country's history that I think we should be having these conversations about. And the beauty of our nation is we can have these conversations. I think we should. But I, can ho I hope that we all agree that when America got started, not everybody in this room was included in its mission vision. Can we all agree on that? OK, that's the point in which I start. All right, so this country was designed in a way to benefit a specific group of people. Can we agree on that? Okay, so what I argue, and some people will, you know, dispute with me the dates in which things have changed. I mean, I, in 2011, would say, you know, maybe we made a little change. I was in a class today. Some of the students there were saying we're at 20%, 30%. If you're doing it a percentage, some were saying 30 or 40, 50%. So people say different things when you look at progress. 
I usually say three to five percent. But today, I've had such a great day, I'm at 3.5%. I'm peaking. Now, that aside, we can debate that at a later time. What I want you to think about is if you can agree with me on America's design, how are we going to change that? Now, would you want that system change? Now, I mean... I don't know about you, but if I was in a system designed for my favorite, I would, I don't know. <laughs> That's just me. Like, I wouldn't answer so fast. I'd be like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I often used to get this question in Iowa when I was walking around, and people would always say, well, what's it like for a black guy? What's it like in Iowa, right? And I used to always say to folks, you know, I'm happy to answer that question, but I always like to know what's it like to be white in America, like to exist in a system designed for your reward. I ask that question. Now, again, we can debate this, and I think it's important. As the time runs down, you are under my spell, so you're in complete agree with, agreement with me right now. So what I say is if we're going to change that system, we have to understand that system. So I devise what I call the theory of incapability. And what the theory of incapability argues is because of this system designed by white people for white people, by men for men, <laughs> by people with resources, for people with resources, by folks who are usually represented by the cross, um, as opposed to folks who are not, by folks with abilities versus folks who may not have all the kind of abilities we're talking about, by people who are heterosexual, for people who are heterosexual. You go on down the line. So you can't look at privilege and system design from a race-based perspective only. So even though this white brother here may have benefits and perks simply because he's white, I mean, we both have benefits simply because we're dudes. And possibly if we're both heterosexual. I mean, I know places that if I say Jesus, I can get perks. <laughs> there could be some places where you would get a job. Or maybe not. If you didn't have Jesus in your resume. Now, again, that's not to say those of us who come from the Christian community are evil, bad people. That's just, I think, important for us to understand from a system design. So if we're going to have changes in that system, we've got to understand that system. And if you individually are thinking about doing work in this system, that you have to adopt the theory of incapability. Last minute, as I explain it to you, and it's this way. Because America's designed by white people for white people, I say white people are incapable of creating an environment in which I'm going to be positive and productive. You can't see genius in me. Because the way the system brought us together was not for you to see me as a genius, but to see me as any, any, miny, mo. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. But in order for you to accomplish that, you have to do something every day. Every day. Have individual understanding, system understanding, and everyday action. Now, the metaphor I use for this is the lion and the lamb. And some of you, if you have some understanding of how that's laid out sometimes in biblical standings or in friendship design, I mean, they say the lion and the lamb are going to exist together peacefully as friends. I say the lion was not designed to be the friend of the lamb. In fact, the lion was designed to do what to the lamb? Like a bowl of Campbell's soup. Mm -mm, good, right? So I say the lion is actually incapable of maintaining a peaceful and friendly existence with the lamb. I'm not saying it's impossible, but if the lion's going to accomplish that every day, the lion's got to do something to fight back that system's design. Because if the lion takes a break, that lamb appears as lunch, not as friend. So this model shifts back. To, as a man, I argue I'm incapable of creating an environment that's fair and just for women. I'm not saying it's impossible, but because of the way systems train me to see women, it's not to see genius. It's not to see chancellor, but to see something else. Or provost, sorry, I didn't mean to give a promotion there right there in front of you. Sorry, my bad. All right, so it's not to see genius, but it's to see something else. Now, any time I got questions about that, I can just watch professional sports and see how women are portrayed. 
It's not for intellect. It's for something else. So I go on down the line. If you have dough, you're good to go. So it's important to understand how resources work in this system. The key is everyday action. People often say to me, man, I kind of like this guy. He's sharp dressed, kind of handsome, smart guy. But man, he's kind of dark, kind of gloomy. That's often the characterization I get. Brother Chancellor, right? So I always say, especially the high school kids, I'm not pessimistic. Don't accuse me of that. I don't believe in that concept. Now, I'm not optimistic either, so I created a new term. I'm what I call pistimistic. Now, here's what that means. That means if you're going to be optimistic, and I don't have a problem if you take optimism as your direction, but you've got to be doing some stuff. Show me what you're doing. Often people have optimism as their mode of operation, but they just think things are going to happen. And what I'm saying is optimism deserves action, needs action every day. And I come up with part of what I've come up with in my theory simply because I'm frustrated. I mean, I, I just have to be honest with you. I'm just not happy with where I'm seeing us headed in the 21st century because it seems to me what we're saying is if you look at this in a ship metaphor, that the ship is about to take the same course in the next 100 years as it just took in the past 100 years from a power perspective. And I'm saying that I'd like to see a different direction, some different results, some maybe more equitable distribution. And so in order to do that, I don't know. I have to be honest, which I don't know if this will work. I'm just asking people to try it for a year. A trial basis, like every day. You can't take a break for one year. Just think how good you would be at taking action around these issues if you didn't take a break every day for the next year. And so for me, it's about challenging folks to maybe take a new approach on how we try to reach what people often ask us to strive for at this time, and that's Dr. King's I Have a Dream. Whatever that means for folks. For me, I just feel like I need something more solid at this time. That I feel like the way systems are going, when I look at the education system, for example, I mean, the results continue to reproduce the same kind of results, particularly when it comes to kids of color and especially black males. I look at the prison system. I look at the bank. I mean, for me, I'm saying, well, let's try something new. So with that, I'm going to give you a few things. One, you can just, I mean, just say white privilege in the mirror tonight, white supremacy in the mirror tonight 10 times. Just get comfortable with the language in your vocabulary so that when you're having discussions about any issue and there are problems, there's challenges, you can say, well, maybe white supremacy has something to do with this. Maybe white privilege has something to do with that. Maybe male privilege has something. Maybe uh, heterosexual privilege. I mean, introducing privilege in the vocabulary. But having an understanding of what that means. I mean, take this conversation home. Right? Just ask folks about what white supremacy means. Like, beginning to have this as a part of how we make these discussions or have these discussions around diversity. Right? Maybe there's some specific groups in which you're working with in which you can have some of these conversations. Maybe there's some events like this event or the White Privilege Conference, shameless plug, but I'll put it in there. Maybe that's an event you can come to, but it doesn't have to be the White Privilege Something that stretches you, though. Something that pushes you. Too often, I think people are doing events that are just simply kumbaya events for me. And I'm not opposed to celebration, but I feel like you got to earn the celebration. Do something. Then let's party for me. But I challenge you to do some events and activities. And uh, lastly, as I just referred to in the previous slide, it's something every day, action. I mean, often when I talk to people from this perspective, they say to me, Dr. Moore, you know, I'm willing to follow this. I mean, I see it, but it just seems so huge. 
I mean, it just seems like I can't do anything in this big old monster. I mean, this just seems way beyond me. And I say to folks, listen, I mean, just take a cooking or baking metaphor with you in reference to this. Don't, I mean, if you take your first baking course, you're not going to bake some eight layer celebration cake as a start. I mean, start yourself out with a slab of dough, cut your piece off, and bake yourself a cookie. Something manageable. <laughs> Seriously, do something that you could do. For example, if you hear any, meeny, miny, mo in your friendship family circle, say something. Right? If you see people getting jobs or getting promotions or not getting any kind of criticism or getting unfair treatment because of gender, because of sexual orientation, because of um, uh, economic status, I mean, say something. I mean, I know there are times when I'm in the mall and I hear some young cats talking about this, talking about that, and using the N-word like it's friendship. And I can't just roll up on any cat and say, boy, don't you know where that word comes from? I mean, you can't just do that with strangers today. But if that's my nephew talking to some kids on his football team, I'm going to check them out. That's a home run moment. That's right there in my circle, right there in my cookie. That's what I'm talking about, stuff you can manage. It's not some of that big, big stuff that folks sometimes are not sure about that I get frustrated with. It's the folks like us who know it's wrong, and sometimes we say nothing. So I'm going to close you out with a story, my last Iowa story. I was flying somewhere far, far away, getting on an airplane in Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa, to be exact, and I'm getting seated, and I can see where I'm seated and behind where I'm going to be seated. About three or four rows back, I see a white dad, about mid-40s or so, with a kid who's probably about five or six, and I love five and six-year-olds. You know why? If they're thinking it, they going to say it, and this kid sees me coming down the aisle, and I see him say to his dad, Hey, Dad, look, there's a black guy. And the dad says to the kid, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just like, now, the dad's not saying white power, long live the Klan. That's not the message he's sending to the kid. He may be dealing with that situation in the way he learned to deal with the situation. But what I think about is the psychological man. Two plus two is four. The message it sends and how that message will carry and it was, you know, in those times where I find myself stepping into a room full of white folks and I come in the room, I don't know if this ever happened to you, and it's like, Shh, don't say anything, don't look, don't look, don't look. <laughs> like some people are afraid to describe their briefcase as a black briefcase when I'm in the room. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's amazing how folks are on arrest about these issues. And then that story helped me understand how sometimes that's the way we get conditioned. Not to conversate, but to be in silence. And I always say to folks, in closing, I'll say this to you. The best friend that hate has is silence. Amen. And so if I can challenge you to do anything going out of here, is to say something. So when you see something that you know is foul, you know it's wrong. In the fourth grade, Jordan, or the 66th grade some of you may be in this room, when you know it's foul, say something. And so it's with that that I'll close out and say thank you for listening. I appreciate that. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Woo. Thank y'all. Asheville. Oh, oh, the Ville, the Ville. The high school kids told me to say the Ville, the Ville, the Ville, not Asheville. It's the Ville. Any questions? You can go to the mic, or you can, well, you got to go to the mic. I was going to say you can scream it out, but I think they want you at the mic for filming purposes. You can ask anything. Anyone? 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 Bueller? Have you considered being a teaching comedian? Oh, teaching comedian. <laughs> I'm, I'm only funny in spurts. Uh, so <laughs> what I like to pride myself on being is a challenging teacher uh, because I sometimes use humor because I know at times this work can be painful. And actually, this work is deadly. I mean, oppression, 
racism, sexism, homo. These are diseases that folk describe them. And disease kills bodies, humans. All right? So for me, I sometimes administer a little laughter because I don't know about y'all, but in my family, that's sometimes the toughest work I have to do. And what I've learned from working with family, sometimes you just got to chuckle a little bit just to stay healthy, just to stay healthy. So I don't attempt to make folks laugh because I'm building up a comedic, a comedic resume. I do it because I think my experience has shown me that sometimes this stuff can be so tough, particularly around white supremacy, white privilege, that it helps to have some laughter in the room. Thank you for that. Yes, sister. What do you say, and then what's a white, middle-class, middle-aged woman supposed to say when a, a black kid calls another black kid nigger? Mm. Now, whoo, let me process that. So, uh, you know, because black folks can't even hear that word in a room by a white person without getting hot. So it's okay. This can happen in this room. Uh, I do, as uh, Sister Fernandez has mentioned, a workshop on the nigger word. So I have mixed emotions, to be honest with you. Uh, in fact, my experience with this workshop has shown me that people spend their lifetime never saying nigger. I mean, in my workshop, we have a great mixture of folks, and I do this exercise where I turn out the lights, and I ask everybody to kind of get in their yoga moment, clear their mind, and, and clear their heads, and I open the door, and I shut the door, and I say, a nigger just walked through the door. Now, I tell them to open their eyes, and tell me, what's the picture that comes to your head? And inevitably, every time across the nation, the picture is me. I mean, not dressed this way, but it's 50. Sagging, gangster, right? And I always say to people, now, you don't have to talk like the Klan to think like the Klan. Like, how can you spend a lifetime never saying nigga, yet the picture you have in the head is me? So I feel like we often try to push kids and challenge kids to not say the word. And I can understand the importance of that because words can hurt. But for me, what's most important with kids of color, black kids especially, is how they see themselves. Like if they recognize and represent by being a nigger stature. But that we don't just have this conversation with black kids, because I mean, depending on who you look, who you talk to and what research you look at, but I mean, basically the urban legend is, is the people buying most of the hip hop are not black kids. All right? Now, whether that's true or not, the bottom line is we know that Drizzle is hitting the suburbs. And what's amazing, this is new in the 21st century. Like, when I was growing up, I could hear nigger 50 times before I got to school. That could be in my house, with my friends walking, blah, blah, blah. But often white kids didn't hear it unless they were in some really horrific kind of household. But now, with Drizzle, or with 50, or with whoever they're listening to, they can hear nigger 150 times. And nobody processed that with them. Like, what does that do to the psyche of a white kid? Right? So I think that this question you asked, for me, is really trying to understand what this brother is saying to this other brother. Because can't we say king? Can't we say brother? Can't we find a better way to relate to each other in friendship? But I'm careful about how I interrupt, because I want to hear their story as well. Because some of those cats say, you outdated, bro. This is how we roll. And I have to be in respect of that and share with them where I come from and be willing to be in disagreement if we're in disagreement at the end. But to let them know that I'm more concerned not about what you say, but what you internalize, what your psyche is. That if your pursuit is this billion dollar nigger industry as opposed to this PhD status, for me, that's my concern. Thank you for that question. That's a powerful one you put out there, sister. That's. Mm. Appreciate it. My brother. Oh, I'm sorry. My sister, sorry. My fault. Watch my fault. out now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, You're sorry. I'm going to have to get sorry. you two cookies. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And I would deserve it. I would deserve it. I, I again, apologize. Yes. Let me open sister. my coat. Oh. <laughs> 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 But that's all right. I forgive you. Thank you. Thank you. You almost took me off my, my thought 
and I had to remember now where I was. But um, so my role in the organization is to be a change agent and somehow um, dismantle racism, be an anti-racism um, um, person, you know, in charge of that, sort of being the conscience of an entire organization. And so um, we're not an hour, but we have, you know, some of the characteristics of Iowa uh, in our community. For certain, just you know, percentages and statistically and so forth. And so, I have heard I've been in the business maybe 15 to 20 years, and I always hear dismantling racism, institutional racism, um, strategically, uh, you know, all the bu the buzzwords. And so, I have never understood how I can convince. Um, uh, a homogeneous organization to change when, you know, what's the incentive? When you think of if it's not broke, don't fix it. And so who is it broke to? And who is the majority? And who does it feel good to? So if it feels good to me, you know, if, if it's the right temperature in the room, you know, don't open the door or mm. you don't turn the thermos, don't change the thermostat because I'm comfortable. Mm. You know, if it's too hot, you know, then it's, depending on if, the, if it's the majority, then you know that, hey, well, just take off your jacket. Why'd you wear something so hot? Mm. You're not comfortable. You know, so how do you get past that stage? You know, because this, I hear it all the time. And I mean, it's, it's generational. You know, you, we all know it's, it's, you have to deal with it on a personal, in a personal and uh, institutional level, and you've got the strategic thinking. But for me, man, I could bang my head into the wall all day long, so I know, but how do I get anybody else? I know they know, but what's the incentive to change? Mm. Well, I, I mean, I, <clears throat> a, a few things come up for me there. Uh, one, um, I think that sometimes dismantling racism can be an oxymoron. Uh, so it depends on how intrinsic, intrinsic this is in the system, because if it's got hundreds of years of, of success and experience, I mean, to think that you're going to dismantle it, even in the 20 years or 50 years you've been doing this work, is, might be a little bit optimistic. Uh, so that's one thing, to remember that we may not see any significant shifts in the time that we exist. So I don't operate thinking I'm going to change my institution anytime soon, and maybe even significantly. But I do feel like I have an understanding that white supremacy is the foundation in which I exist, in which I work. And so I won't always find success in that. And that's a different state of mind for me to operate in for me. Because this is a health care issue. Like, you will die if you do the same thing over and over and over again, get the same kind of results. It produces hypertension, things that are unhealthy and, un and, 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 and not good for you. So you got to be healthy in your balance. So some of the things I try to do is find white people in my environment that are willing to die like they died in the Civil Rights Movement, like they're willing to put it all on the line. And that's not necessarily the case, especially in today's time, that you're going to be killed in the way some of these uh, young folks lost their lives back that time. But that's a different state of mind to exist in, that you're willing to put it all on the line. I think that's important in your institution because there are going to be times that you just can't say it and it's going to be heard. And so having white folks in that environment that's going to step forward and be willing to take it all on is one of the things that I think I would suggest that's important in your environment. Would you ask Jane to bring me with her next time she comes? Yeah, because Jane's going to be one of my speakers in two years, so I've already put in a preliminary um, invite to her, but I'm going to do an official one when I get back to my office. But I, I would definitely be pushing for Jane to support a contingency. And I heard that um, the, the uh, chancellor was in the house. So maybe we can rub some elbows and yeah. he might That's right. be able to find some funds. Thank you, sister. My brother.
Okay, can you hear me? I'm a sculptor. I'm from Chicago. And I moved to Asheville because Asheville is a beautiful place. You know, it's got mountains and nice weather. Now, in my practice, you know, I have a studio here in, near Woodfin. And I got a little white kid to come in to my studio because I welcome everybody. And he comes in, and I, I give him paper, and he draw. I help him make little airplanes, you know. And as I get to know him, I ask him about his school, the school he go to, and his friends. And, it, and in the conversation, it came up that one of the kids in his class is black, you know. And I said, well, that's good. I said, you ever play with him? He said, no, because my father told me, he said, my parents told me that blacks are criminals and crooks, you know, and we don't play with them, you know. And I looked at him, I said, well, don't you know I'm black? <laughs> and he looked at me, you know, and he didn't say anything too much to me. But as we went on, day after day, we get to, I get working with him. He's building a little airplane and stuff. And I told him, I said, when you see blacks on TV, because I've seen it many times, they portray criminals at one time in Asheville as a black guy. They put his name down, but they always mention that he's black. The white guy, they put his name down, but they don't mention he's white. Sometimes they do. A lot of times they don't. But he's Joe Blow. He's John so-and-so. So I brought this up to the kid and say that wouldn't it be nice if the black guy, that's criminals that you see on television, should have a name? Call him a name. That's Joe. Well, that's John committed the crime. But in the meantime, it came up, the conversation came up a couple of weeks later. And he said, you know, Mr. King, you know what? He said, my daddy told me that you're not black, you're an artist. <laughs> I, just, I just found it, you know, kind of interesting. And I find, you know, Asheville kind of interesting. I know that 18% of Asheville is black. 20% would include the Mexicans, if you just look on your statistics about maybe less than one-tenth of one percent you see downtown at any event, you know? And I used to ask myself, well, why is that? So I'd go to a black person and say that, hey, you know, why aren't black people downtown participating in Asheville? And the question came, was that, well, we just don't go there. <laughs> and my wife and I, you know, we, we, we go over to the YMI, and during the last two years, not this year, this summer, but the last two summers, we go and we teach art with the kids. You know, most of the black kids that come at the YMI, they come in, in a little, little bus during the summer months. You know, and I get together, we get together with slides, we get together with uh, information to show the kids how to do little things, like for instance, making masks. So we'll collect masks, pictures of masses from all over the world. And we inform the kids that making masses, it make you something else. You become another thing. So when you put that mask on, you know, you can be foolish, you can act whatever way you want to act, and all of a sudden you're transformed. And these kids produce some of the most beautiful masses that you ever want to see in the class. But I just wanted to just bring those attention to you because what you're talking about is programming, how we are, our computers in our head is programmed by our community, by our schools, by everyone, you know? And we, th we don't know how to get rid of that. And the hardest task in the world is deprogramming that, that information, you know? It's very hard, and I admire just what you've just said because you're talking about how to deprogram us. Thank you very much. Thank you, my brother, I appreciate that. Sis. Hi, Dr. Moore. I'm Kriya. Nice to meet you. Um, I think I'm running in parallel in a, a parallel path as the, the lovely woman there that checked you a little bit a couple yeah, minutes ago. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, is that I'm also in a in a you know heterogeneous in school environment, and we have really kind of busted open some conversation um, over the last year and some you know compassionate, passionate, committed individuals in in my organization are really. Um, committed to this journey 
and, st and this dialogue and all of the action that it will take to, to, um, to be on this journey and together. But my question is, is, is how I'm, I'm in a similar position that I'm kind of heading off, um, heading off the initiative in a way and how to approach those um, and their teachers, you know, I mean, their educators educating other children with these, with, on how to be multiculturally competent. Um, and many of them have some different levels of sickness. As we know, as the ones who are the most sick, you know, realize it the least. You know, they're the least aware that they're the least aware. So how do we, how do we start this journey and bring this stuff that we know this is where it has to begin? So yeah, we, we're having the, okay, we're, we're celebrating all of the diversity that we do have. You know, we're trying to get, it, get to know each other for who we really are underneath the stuff that we see every day and appreciate the diversity that's there. That's a beautiful thing, like you said. But we get that we need to crack this open to really get, get to the next level. So how do we do this um, w without being threatening? How do we bring this so that it can be heard and, and absorbed and worked on without people running, screaming from the room, or just avoiding or happening to be sick that day when the conversation's happening, you know? Yeah, well, I, I think two things. One, leadership. I mean, you need somebody at the front saying, you know, this is where we have to go next. Mm -hmm. And I think there has to be someone in that key position uh, who is saying that this is not an option for you. This is the direction that our organization is going in. Uh, I think also, um, uh, uh, secondly, that my motto, and I learned this from a good friend and colleague down um, uh, who was at Florida State, but now he's living in Atlanta, Dr. Lee Jones. He always used to say, I'm damned if, I'm do, if I do, I'm damned if I don't, so I'm going to be damned being who I am. And so I think at times you have to say to folks who are or holding up these smoke screens or these stiff arms that, you know, we can't wait on you because kids are at stake. And so I think it's really important to understand that some people use those tactics as a way to actually be deterring to what you're trying to do, that they're really not afraid. They're really not maybe that discomfortable or uncomfortable, that sometimes that is a tactic for resistance. And so I think there has to be a time that that's called out. But you can't get everybody moving at the same time and think that you're going to get there and accomplish what you want to accomplish. So some folks may be left behind. So I would, I would strongly suggest that you talk with leadership that can step forward and say, this is where we're going. And even if you take four or five folks as a starting point, that can come back and bring the other folks along at a different point, but bring them along, most importantly because this is where kids need to be. Mm -hmm. And I say this all the time, especially when I go back to Iowa, that if we're preparing those kids to live and work in Iowa, we're really shrinking their options for the 21st century. And for kids who want to be making things happen and getting paid in the 21st century, the more you have diversity in your life, the better chance you're going to be uh, the better options you're going to give yourself. Mm -hmm. And it, you don't even have to believe me. You can look on the website for Starbucks Corporation. Look on the website for Microsoft and see the job descriptions and see what they're asking for. And you will find that they need global citizens to be competitive in a global world. Mm -hmm. And the more you add that to your life for young people, the better off you're going to leave yourself with options in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you. L.A. in the house. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Tanya Marie, and I recently moved to the area from Los Angeles. I want to just give you a little example of my dilemma, my situation, what have you, and then I want you to speak on what you could recommend that I do to overcome this. Uh, I live in an area in Hendersonville up in the mountains called Laurel Park. And uh, I, was, I, I didn't know anything about Asheville Laurel Park. I found my place with a view, a phenomenal view on the internet. Coming from Los Angeles, I retired at a young age, live in a beautiful area, beautiful place, and the neighbors sort of got a little bit suspicious. So I got a knock on my door and was asked, do you live here? <laughs> and you know, my response was just, whoa, wait a minute, we don't do this where I'm from. We bring a basket of wine, you know, <laughs> apples, what have you. So anyway, I said, and what about an introduction? And so we introduced, and he was content that 
I'm a neighbor. Another neighbor came and asked me, how did you find out about up here? And then I got to thinking, what is going on here? But these folks up in my neighborhood are not from Asheville nor the South, or should I say from this area. They're from New York, Connecticut, wherever. They can afford to have homes and wherever, whether it's in Bermuda, Europe, where have you. <clears throat> I live full time here. And they're still trying to figure me out. I bought a second car. I've never owned a luxury car in my life, so I finally bought my retirement present for myself. I got another knock on the door. Your visitors need to park in the visitor parking. You have two cars. <laughs> and I said, whoa, wh what are you talking about? Well, we see a black car over there that's been there for a couple weeks now that happens to be mine. They couldn't understand it nor accept that I could have two cars, live amongst them, and afford to do what they do. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, what on earth have I done? And what kind of place is this? So after a while, they began to accept me because I took care of the place. I planted a beautiful garden in the mountains. And I became, they were comfortable with me. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, what do you do in a situation like that? I've earned their respect now because I'm sort of on their level, but it still baffles me because I've never been subjected to racism in all my life, running the beaches of Los Angeles, what have you, until I came here living a retirement life in the mountains. What do you recommend that I even begin to do? Well, I mean, I, I think uh, first I, I would recommend that you take care of yourself because it's not your job in your retirement to be working at your home, <laughs> if you ask me. So I think you got to take care of yourself and be really, um, you know, um, I think you have to be really careful about how much of this work you want to do in, you know, the state that you're in and your retirement in your home. Now, if you want to take that on, I mean, that's great. You can have, you can host dinners. You can invite folks over. I think there's some folks here who do some courageous conversations at people's homes. I mean, there's some things like that that you can do, but I think really, bottom line though, you need to let them know how you feel. Well, you we need... have meetings once a year, the association meetings, and it's it's gonna be coming up. Right. And I'm thinking, do you raise issues like yeah, this? Yeah, I, I, I think you really need to, in a way that, I mean, I don't know the area, but I, I think, I mean, it's not like you're going to get evicted. <laughs> no. So I just really think that you need to let them know that as you live here, you need to know how you're feeling upon first being welcomed here. And I think that your hopes are going forward that we can, you can be a part of the community, grow the community, but I feel like it's gonna be better for your long-term stay if you really honestly let them know how that made you feel when you first came here. And then after that, how you continue to open yourself up and your home up is really up to you. But for me, for me, what comes up, if that's the first greeting you get, I have really suspicion for me. Now, I know I need some therapy because I grew up in this anti-white kind of mentality, but as soon as one white person does something wrong, the next 10 suffer the price. <laughs> I mean, that's just how I operate. I just, I'm just in suspicion, but I know that's unhealthy and that's where I'm at and I'm trying to work on that. And mm -hmm. so, for me, what comes up is when someone greets you first in that way, it's hard for me to really com com become completely open. I'm not unwilling to go there, but there has to be some things done for me to get there. So I would say if you decide to go there, that you do it in a brutally honest way. Mm -hmm. And that you take care of yourself and protect yourself along the way. Because when folks greet you in that way, upon not knowing you at all, on the first greeting, for me, that's a caution light. That's a caution line. So that's what I would say. And I'll give you my card because I'm happy to be a resource for you as well if I can offer any suggestions, any books, or I mean a book club, something like that. Anything like that could be a way you can have that kind of interaction with your neighbors. Thank you so much. All right, I got to take a couple more and then I got to go. Let's go here then here. Sister. Okay, she was first. Oh, well, I'm sorry. We'll go. Great, great. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Moore, I think I need to tell that a lady that I live in Laurel Park. Uh, <laughs> And oh, I'll are there any other Laura Park no, residents? Seriously, I'll give you my phone number. Yeah, yeah, Laura there you Park. go. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you say that you're concerned that we are seem to be drifting back to where we came from. And I have to tell you that uh, one of the areas that I think that's very exemplified 
by is education and resegregating our school systems. Um, here, in, here in North Carolina, especially in Wake County and in Henderson, uh, we have, uh, under the guise of neighborhood schools, drifted back and are drifting back. So my question to you is, how do you address this? How, how do we make a difference in, you, in letting education be the vehicle that takes us back to segregation? And how do you answer both black and white parents who say their children can get a better education in charter schools that cater to those racial groups? Mm. Ooh, now, you bring up a pretty tough question because I have mixed emotions about segregation, particularly for young black males in the education system. Now, I, me, this is me, not endorsed by the university in this response. Uh, I don't believe there's anything wrong with the education system. I think that we make an uh, error in approaching it as if something's wrong with it. That actually the education system is doing exactly what it was designed to do, particularly for kids of color and especially for black males, where more of them are coming out of there and going to prison than they're going to jail. That's not failure. That's success. And so for me, it may be when you look at segregation model for black males, especially in the 20th century, I think we found more success under that model than we did the integration model. Some would argue, and I would be willing to hear that argument. So I would say to some of those parents, you know, mm, let's give it a try then. If we can get the same reason, if you can give Dr. Moore and the school of Paul Robeson the same resources that you could give this school, the white school, charter school, then let's do that. But what I would ask for is in that design that there be some cross-cultural, multicultural kinds of interaction. I think where I would get concerned is that the pursuit of segregation is for the pursuit of whiteness, which is what I often find in these models, is it's not that we're designing this because we think it's a better education, it's because we don't want them with those kids. And that's a different kind of approach. So I have mixed emotions about the segregation model, particularly about black males, because I feel like the integration model was created not for their success, but for their failure. And it's working. And so I'm saying in places that I'd be willing to take 10 million and construct a school for young black males and produce you results. If you give me the resources and let me design the staff and curriculum, I can guarantee you I feel like I can bring you a different kind of result than what they're getting at the public schools. Now again, I was just at Randolph. Now, I mean, I'm not saying anything against the principal, but the set up, that model set up, it's a little jacked up if you ask me, where there were a lot of kids of color there. A lot. And I think that it seems like they're not under their under a model of excellence. I think that at least my perception is you ask people about Randolph, it's not like, you know, Paul Robeson School for Excellence. Although there's some great things going there, some great leadership there doing some blazing stuff, I have to say that. But for me, I think segregation could be a model that I would be willing to embrace if the resources were the same. So I come at it with mixed emotions, but I am really concerned if people are designing these schools to escape diversity as a way to keep their kids protected or in a better system, which is often what I would assume this model you're talking about is being created. It's not really for the excellence of education, it's really to keep them away from those kids. And if we have those mentalities creating schools in the 21st century, I think um, Derek Bell wrote a great book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well. I think that's okay. Like, you should be identified as a racist institution, and you should be allowed to do that. Like, if you want to build a white supremacy high school or university, you should allow, be allowed to do it. But you should pay, like, an extra tax, or you should be identified. Seriously, Derek Bell draws up this hypothetical situation, says, let that happen. But let's identify these institutions so I know that this school is built on this policy. And for me, as a community member, I wouldn't be in agreement with that, but I like knowing. 
And so for me, I think it's important if those institutions are coming under construction that we call them out. And we let folks know, here's what's going on there. And so that's kind of what I'm thinking as I hear you present that. And I'll give you my card because I have to keep contemplating that, but that's what comes up now. Thank you for asking that. Thank you for asking that. When I go to conferences, I kind of take on an alter ego sometimes. And I do. I, I tell people that, you know, especially when they're doing uh, achievement gap conferences, that I argue for segregation. And it really kind of just stirs up the audience a little bit to have po folks know that one of the options we should consider if we're talking about closing the achievement gap is segregation. Because we may not be able to accomplish this closing in an integrated model. And so if excellence is the result we're pursuing, I'd be will willing to entertain that. But if it's this model of supremacy, we got to call that out. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. OK, I see somebody else slide. So let's say last two. Sister. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Moore, for engaging this conversation, much needed in our community. Um, and I just have one thing that I'd like to address, which is, um, as a person who identifies with the GLBTQ community and has uh, family members who also identify as such, um, the uh, use of your word faggots um, struck me similarly to the way I imagine you were struck in the video store to hearing the word colored. And although I feel that simply changing our vernacular is not the solution, I think allowing our speech to reflect where we're coming from and what we're working with um, in terms of dismantling our own prejudices um, is quite important. Um, and I, I would ask that you look at that when talking specifically about your own internalized um, oppressions and um, specifically surrounding G the GLBTQ community. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that, and what I can assure you is I'll think about that and, 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 and put that in consideration. But what comes up for me is just like when I talk about the nigger word, like I don't use the N-word, because for me that makes it PG. And so I think that it's important for us in the, in, in, in the, in the systems in which we're dealing with these kinds of oppressions to be able to call it like it is, especially when it's... Do you identify as a faggot? No, 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 that's, that's the way in which that I was articulating that, that it's played out in my mind. That's the way I learned the references. So no, I don't identify uh, as that. That's just what came up for me as I brought it up in discussion. So do you think it's an appropriate parallel to say your use of the word faggot is synonymous with using the word, the N-word? For some folks, it could be. Just like you could have, you said that I had that reaction to uh, the um, colored word. I mean, some folks could have, as I would have the white sister saying the nigger word. And for me, what I would say to her is not to use that. Actually, I'm glad you used that, because that feeling, that emotion needs to be in the air, because that's part of what we have to talk about. When we're going to be in these kinds of conversations, and so for me, I feel like I'm in a space where if I'm talking about especially my own kind of uh, challenges and emotion, I got to say it how it's coming to me. And I'm, and, so, and I'm sharing my reaction. And I appreciate you hearing me and right. saying that you'll think about it and, and receive that in terms of future speeches. That's all mm -hmm. that I'm asking. No, and I, I appreciate that. I'll have to give you my card so I can stay in touch because I appreciate that. Thank you. Say your name for me. Liana. Liana. Thank you, Liana. Hi. Last one, sister. Yes. Uh, boy's getting good now. <laughs> um, my name's Tara. And um, yeah, I guess, you know, even for, you know, people who are, you know, feel that they're really racially sensitive, um, um, you know, the, something that's been confusing me quite a bit lately is the use of the word Mexican or the title of being Mexican, where we can see that it's a great big you know, South America is a really big place, you know? And so, you know, with our, our artist gentleman friend over here, you know, so many people within our community as well use the word to describe the Hispanic community as, as Mexicans when, you know, it's really this, you know, enormous and diverse 
you know, continent. And uh, I just, you know, I'm wondering what other people's opinions about that. Because I, I, I feel like, you know, I'm really pretty confused myself because, you know, I'm trying to, you know, tell my kids, you know, that play on the soccer team, oh, the Mexican guys. When even the coach, and I'm like, you know, hey, Max, that's not really not appropriate. Maybe he's not from Mexico. He could be from Nicaragua, you know. And he's like, well, even the Mexican kids call themselves Mexicans, you know. And the coaches say the Mexicans. And they even have, like, a get-together for the beaners. You know, so it's really interesting, you know, the use of um, how liberally even people who, th you know, feel that, um, you know, they're uh, speaking very, you know, politically correct, or I think use the word Mexican to, I think in some, some way it's, it's very demeaning to people who have a really broad culture. And I, didn't, I don't even know if there's some Hispanic people who would like, like to give their opinion about that, because I find it to be, you know, some people that I've spoken with said, no, that's not... You know, that's not demeaning to me. I mean, you know, but other people find it, I think, do find it offensive. So just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, and yeah. I, I hope you could be around for folks to respond to that because I yeah. think that's where I would go with what you're saying. Yeah. And I think there could be some similarities with sure. black and African American, where right. for some folks, I mean, African American be appropriate, black would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. I know colored is not a word I would recommend. Right, uh, sure. And there are some words that could be off limits. For some sure. of my friends, uh, they're right with you that mm -hmm. I'm not from Mexico, so I don't like that reference. So right. some friends go by Chicano, some like Latina, Latino. Right. So it could be different for individual folks. And my mm -hmm. philosophy has always been to ask. Mm -hmm. And um, most importantly, if someone says to you, you know what, like if I came back here and I knew the sister was in the audience and that brought up things for her, I, I mean, that's, I, I can right. definitely be in consideration of that because right. that's not the feeling sure. I want to give folks. I'm just wondering. And so so I think it's important just to right. ask somebody, it's my right. philosophy in reference to that. Right. I'm just wondering if there's a consensus. Like, isn't there a consensus about this yet? No. I, <laughs> you know, like. I don't think there's consensus, but I do think okay. that you need, if, if you have a problem with right. your son or your. Mm -hmm. Your kid having that reference, you can't sure. control the coach. Sure. You can't control the other kids. I would say start there. Right. And what I would say to my son is, listen, that's not the way we refer to folks that we don't know. Sure. Right? So you need to get to know his name or her name and refer to them then. And that way, get to know them. And then we can ask them. Right? And so the reference is through a relationship, mm -hmm. not through distance. Sure. And that's critical that your reference to someone is because you got to know them and are interacting with them as opposed to you don't know what to say, so you just say what everybody else is saying. Right, right. And so that's part of what I would suggest going forward is control that cookie in your life and saying to that little one in your life, listen, let's build this through a relationship, mm -hmm. not through something we don't know or we heard or we're hearing from other people. Sure. And that could be a way to also you know, engage that piece. But others may have some thoughts about that. Just because of time, sure. I would say, let's make sure that you're identified so that folks can come up, because I think yep. um, they want me to get up out of here. Thank and you. So um, I want to thank you all for staying over time. I want to also remind you that, you know, as any speaker should be, I'm Facebook accessible, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter accessible. But I know that not everybody can have would have, you know, or would, or is comfortable speaking in front of a large audience. So if you have other questions, please send me a response. If there's something that, you know, you do think could help me in getting better and doing this kind of work, please send me that response. I appreciate, which sometimes cannot be that popular when you step to the speaker and say, Doc, you need to know this is how I'm feeling. But I need to know that. So I appreciate that coming from the audience. And if you're not comfortable from the mic, send me something electronically because I really appreciate that. And I thank everybody who's played a role from the sisters here at the facilities, the, the, the folks on the sound, on the video, and especially my good sister, Jane Fernandez, who has brought me here and shown me the utmost hospitality. Where's Deborah? Is Deborah Miles here? Sister Deborah has been escorting me in the swagger wagon along with Jewel. Uh, and so I appreciate them also helping me out. And again, I hope I come back to the big city, to the Ville. And um, I appreciate, again, y'all not only attending, but staying extra time. So thank you again. Thank you very much.